Hi, I'm Jeff Goulding and I'm a Liverpool author. And I'm Kieran Smith, a Liverpool historian. Together, we've been working on a great new project, which is a book out later this year entitled The Untouchables, Anfield's Band of Brothers. It's a great story about one of the greatest sides in Liverpool's history who won back-to-back titles in the 1920s. Yeah, this is a team that is absolutely packed with incredible characters. Men who fought on the battlefields of Europe in the First World War and returned home to claim two league titles in a row. And it's due for release in the UK in September. And thanks to our friendship now with the Liverpool Connection podcast, um, it's also going to be made available through them in the United States at the same time. Hello and welcome to the Liverpool Connection podcast. I am Dazza. I've got Steve with me today. And then just before um, we introduce our special guest today, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out. I'm 50 years old and saying shout out. That's, that just sounds so weird. Um, but there's a company out of Liverpool. It's two lads um, called Scouts Power 19. Um, they put out quality T-shirts. It's local and it's always good to support local artists. But uh that's the T-shirt. That's one of them. That's their brand new one. Um, you can go on their website at scousepower19.com. All right, let's get to this next guest. And I cannot wait uh, to have a good chit-chat with him. It's former Times football editor, uh, freelance writer, an author and renowned Liverpool journalist, Tony Evans. I am eight. As, as how are you? I am good. I'm good. I'm good. Um, well, let's get cracking. Um, I know you've said before, like, um, you haven't really, like, remembered, like, your first match that you really ever went to. Um, uh, that's what I've read. Uh, but what 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 is one of the mo- most earliest matches that you can, like, fully remember? Well, there's bits and bobs, which I kind of don't fully remember. I mean, I, I, I was too young when I went to the first game, you know, because that's the thing. I, if I take it back a bit, I always remember reading Fever Pitch and, you know, sort of, he talks about going to Arsenal for the first time, coming up, seeing the green of the pitch and, you know, and the crowds and all that. And, and he was hooped and I thought, entryist. You know, it's like it's people just went the match. You didn't. It wasn't a big occasion. It wasn't something that you remembered. Mm-hmm. It was just part of a, a, a normal culture. So my members, my memories seem to be uh, the, the sort of start to develop in, in the late sixties. You know, I can remember Huddersfield being in the um, in, in, in the the old first division, the top flight, and but mainly because I was in it was in the main stand, and I was in the back row of the main stand, and I could stand up. It's um, I remember I remember the toss of the coin game um, against Bill Bale, you know, and um, and uh, but I don't remember any of the game. You know, it's all the the, the first games I remember uh, begin to come clearly. Uh, so it was in the late sixties and early seventies, and I. I Again, it's sometimes you. The way football has changed, it's become something that's that's big, and and and, and you know because of the prices and because of the way, um, uh, you know, sort of, it, it's turned into a big event. But when I was growing up, it wasn't. You just went the match. Everyone I knew went the match. They either went to Anfield or Goodison, and you know it. It, it wasn't. You know, this is, it wasn't a cherished memory as such, at least certainly not for me. Yeah, and I think a, a, a lot of people back then as well, you know, uh, like after the match is finished, they basically go down to the pub and maybe talk about five minutes about the match. And then the rest was just having a good laugh and having some pints. Yeah. So, so yeah. it's it's massively changed. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing for me, which makes a difference, is that... Uh, uh, my dad died when I was 14. So it was a case of, you know, if he would have been still alive later on, I would have said to him, you know, what was, what's the first game you took me to? I, you know, I took my little brother to his first game when I think he was like five. and um, But, you know, so it's, I'm still here. So he knows, you know, we, 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 we talked about it, you know, oh, you, the first game. So he mightn't remember it as clearly as perhaps, you know, uh, 
you know, as to, if he was a little bit older, but I'm, I was there to tell him about it. So, so that's the other factor in it. But I, I yeah, again, it, it's football wasn't, and some people look at it these days, and because of the the nature of society changing, and think that supporting the club the way it is is an affectation. It's you know something that you've. Um, it's a conscious choice, you know, it's one of them. It really wasn't. You just, you know, you, your dad went the match before you, you went the match, you know, your, your brothers, your neighbours, everyone. So it was, I mean, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I've got a couple of mates that, uh, you know, obviously Scousers as well, but, um, you know, they first started going to uh, watch Southport. So, you know, they've got that memory. And then, you know, when, when people ask them, well, you're from Liverpool, what are you doing watching Southport? But it's just where where their dad would go to watch footy. Because, uh, you know, uh, even back in the day, uh, it, it cost quite a bit of money, you know, to get into the match. Not not as much as, as today, but still, you know, it, it took like a working man's, you know, pay to, to, to get in there. Well, well, that's the thing as well. It's like you didn't, you know. Once you, once I started going, you know, without me, our fella, so with, with me mates, and you know, sort of that was by the time it was about nine or ten, you know, sort of queue up and you, you know, you'd be there at like sort of twelve. You queue up, be first in the Anfield roads, hanging over the, the fence. You know, I can I can pick myself out and say the uh, the Munch and Gladbach game in seventy three. Not because I can see myself, but my mates had bright red hair next to me, and then. <laughs> It's, it's, uh, but not not only did you do that, but before I started going away, I'd go to Goodison every Saturday. You know, it's um, uh, you know, so I started to go a bit older. I went to Tranmere on Friday nights. You know, you, you just went, you know, the, you, you went the game. It was part of a, a social thing. And when you go into the eighties, the, the, you know, once the uh, the televised games, so there was games on Sundays. If we didn't have a game on Saturday, and Everton were away, it's like I did about ten o'clock on. Um, on, on, on Saturday morning, I get a phone call from my mates and like, and he'd be like, all right, do you fancy going to the match? Where do you reckon? And book at the Daily Mirror and go through the fixtures and see the, like, the lower league clubs that were nearest, you know, within a reasonable distance, you know, that we could either jump on the train and get there in an hour or, or we drive, you know, we could borrow his mother's car. And so we, we just, we went to football, you know, it's like mm -hmm. we went to the match, we were Liverpool fans and we never made any bones about it, but the match was about... Yeah, I sort of what was the bottom line? If going the match was about the actual match, I would have stopped very early. But mm -hmm. it wasn't. It was about going with your mates. It was about drinking. It was about going to strange places which you might it might never go, you know, under any other circumstances, you know. And um, and that's that's what you did. Yeah, and I was about to say, I hope you weren't like nine or ten when you when they were borrowing in your mum's car. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to bring Steve in now. <laughs> hey, hey, Tony, good morning or good afternoon for you. Thank you for, for joining us. You know, this conversation is interesting because in Austin right now, um, they just have a professional uh, football team. This is their first year going to start playing. And you see the, uh, the type of emotion that it's kind of invoked in a lot of the, the soccer fans. But like you said, it, it's, um, it's not even about the game right now, right? Since they, they've just started playing, it's more about – people wanting to be a part of something. And I, I guess that would be a different situation than actually living in Liverpool where the club was already there, right? It's already had the, you know, 60 years of history, 70 years of history. And it, you just has take, it's just part of the culture. Whereas now, you know, the team here in Austin, they're building their culture. So it's, it's kind of fascinating to, to kind of equate the, the two situations. And, but the, just the passion of, you know, the Liverpool fans that we get to see on a, on a daily basis, and then now here in Austin, it's it's quite fascinating just the the social aspect of it. Yeah, and 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 that's the thing that'll make it work in Austin, and and you know it, it's. I mean, I've I've been very lucky because mm -hmm. I, I was a Liverpool fan, and I you know the for me the you know the the years of my twenties, well teens mm -hmm. and twenties were the the most successful period, and it was brilliant to be young and do all that. Mm -hmm. But you know what? In many ways. Kind of it being Liverpool didn't matter. You know, if I would have been an Everton fan, I would have had a good time as well. If I would have been a City fan or a United fan or even a Tranmere fan, you know, what it was about was 
going, as I say, going to places that you'd never go before, uh, uh, never go, under, you know, and and with your mates and having a great time. And it's, you know, I, people talk about the, the famous 5 nil against Nottingham Forest, you know, and um, and which, you know, was, was a good performance. It wasn't as great as everyone says, you know, I'll, I, you know, Tom Finney says it was the best he's ever seen. And while I'm, you know, so I, I will almost always defer to the Preston plumber. You know what? I saw plenty of performance that year that were as good. But by about like, you know, by, by, by about 70, 75 minutes gone, you know, one of my mates had his back to the game talking on the cop. You know, we were like, <laughs> we, we were, I wouldn't say blase about the, the, the game because... Now, of course, you want to win. And, of course, the expression of Scouts pride and Scouts power, you know, was part of what made it so important. But there were loads of games where you kind of, you'd switch off, you know, you'd be talking, you know, it, is it three-quarter time yet so we can go to pub? It wasn't the, the, I suppose one of the things that gets me now is when I go to Anfield, for example, the, the singing of You'll Never Walk Alone. And everyone's got the flags up and they sing it. And it's terribly serious and you have to do it because you, you have to show this Anfield atmosphere. And it kind of wasn't there when I was young. It was like, it just was organic. Mm-hmm. It was a bit daft. It was a bit, you know, sort of a bit ramshackle. You know, no one knew what they were doing. And sometimes that applies on the pitch as well. But, you know, it, was, um, it wasn't it wasn't a serious business. And now I feel sometimes serious. And I'm not slagging people off for that. You know, they want to be part of this. Um, it was just, it's, it's not that I'm saying it's bad. It's just different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like you're right. You know, at the beginning when it's more of a jovial type of situation, now it's it's almost like a mandate, right? That the anthem is going to come out and you, you need to participate to show your uh, true true support for the team. Yeah, and, and I think it's uh, because it's changed. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, people, you know, you've got to have, your tickets way in advance, and for someone who hasn't got a season ticket and wants to go, and especially from someone from out of town or abroad, it's it's a big deal. It's a pilgrimage, and you go there and you want to you want to you know play a part in it all. I, it, it was it was it was very different when I was growing up in the sense that it was you know the the, the, the there was still a lot of fans from you know sort of outside the city and and um, and even abroad that come over. Um, especially from Ireland, but it was, you know, it was kind of, it, 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 they, they were more or less regulars if they came, and it wasn't a big event. You know, you get Man United, um, you know, famously, one of the things that turned Klopp off about United was Ed Woods was talking about it being, you know, like Disneyland. You know, so you you go, you know, you're not going to go to what well, some people do, but most people don't. You're not going to go to Disneyland every two weeks, and, you know, you're not going to, you know, it it doesn't. It, well, it's it's not going to be. You know, so the the Disneyland experience is the big day out. You know what they're looking for. Uh, ideally, they, they, what they're looking for is chain on the seats and people who come. And it's a once a season thing, and they spend a whole lot of money because it's. And you know they're aiming to get that, and thankfully, it'll probably never happen. But you know, it's a, but for, for many people going, it's a huge event, mm-hmm. which. For for at the time of sort of when I started going and through the the, the years that when, when I went most it wasn't it, it wasn't considered a huge event it was just considered a normal part of your life something you did and sometimes it was like you know, sometimes oh god do I have to go to the match <laughs> you know <it's> like, <laughs> you know and and but but it was almost you had to go to the match because all your mates are going and you know and if you you didn't go, you might miss on, out on some adventure. So, you know, it was, it was it was just very different. Yeah, you know, this this last weekend, I actually went with about 300 people to Nashville for um, to support the team. And, and it was a great experience. But then I'm now I'm like, man, I'm going to be disappointed not to go to all the away matches. <laughs> and obviously you can't do that. You know, the United States is so big, you can't travel that that will so it's a uh, i understand how what you know you're not wanting to miss adventures especially with your mates you know and, yeah. and the things that might happen on the pitch so you know for example would would anything in my life have ever taken me to norwich probably unlikely oh, no. you know and, and norwich is just one you pull out you know it's um <laughs> you know it's a long it, it's it's one of the longest journeys and you know it's there, there's no real reason to go there but you're the match ipswich you know places like that um 
you know, football football teaches boys. When you get there, you find out actually that you know they're pretty good, you know. And then you know, you, and I say like you know, it's a, the the era that I, when I went most was to to away games. You know, it's associated with hooliganism, but that that's really overplayed. You know, most places you go, you go into the pubs, and if you behaved yourself, have a drink, people just talk to you, and you know mm-hmm. you. They, they, you know, some people did want to beat the crap out of you, and you know, and, and some people did misbehave. But the vast majority of the time, it was just people going to football matches, having a laugh, and they're quite interested in what you know, what you thought, and you were interested in them. So it, it was great, and and I say, like, hopefully, being on the the, the ground for this, you know, the, the beginnings for you will develop. That way, you know, a community develops mm-hmm. and it becomes so natural and so organic. And, you know, you just, it, it, it's, it, you, you can say, in some ways, it seems to be less special. But actually, it's more special, mm-hmm. you know, because it, it as, as, as I say, it's, it, it's a community thing. It's not, it's not the big day out. It's, it's what you do with people that yeah. you like and people that you, you feel a kinship with. I think it's yeah, awesome. It's, it's, uh, go ahead, sorry, Des. Oh, I was just I was going to say it. <laughs> go, go on, lads. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, it's very rare to be part of something at the very beginning. So it's a it's a different atmosphere versus, you know, coming into a Liverpool as a, a supporter from outside of Liverpool and, and learning the history and, and getting, you know, uh, immersed into the culture of Liverpool. So that was, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good experience, but, you know, the red, the red blood is still there. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's there, there are different types of support. I've, I've never really been one of the people who like, you know, go, oh, you know, I support, you know, you know, a list of a, a bunch of teams I support in different sports. You know, I'll, I'll follow other teams, but in football, I'm a Liverpool fan. Right, right. That's, that's about it. But it, it, it never takes away me pleasure of going to other grounds. You know, one of the, mm-hmm. One of the best things in the past few summers and the pandemic for an end to it, we um, often went to Granada and went to their grounds when they were in uh, the Spanish second division. You know, it was, it was fantastic, a great experience, so different to the football and experiences that I've had. And it's just so enjoyable. And it, it's, again, you could see the, the, the community there, you know, because it's now a big fan base and all that. And even though you're not part of it, you know, just being sitting there observing it, it it's just wonderful. I mean, football, the, the biggest thing about football is that it should bring people together and it should be fun. It's not a serious business. If you lose, you know what, move on. There's another match coming along in a minute and, you know, and things will get better. Yeah, you know, let's let's get into some serious business. Your your uh, your writings, and one of the things that we enjoy uh, bringing authors on is just hearing their journey, how they became uh, writers, how they uh, chose to, you know, obviously being from Liverpool, the, the the topic is there already. But can you share with us your your journey to to become a published author and what and share with our uh, viewers and listeners that first book and your mindset going into that? Well, I mean, I. Yeah, so I say, I come from uh, like one of the um, one of the most deprived areas in the United Kingdom. Um, when I was growing up, it was consistently in the the top five poorest areas. Um, the, the school that I went to, I wouldn't say it was a crap school, but it was quite a good school actually. The Liverpool Catholic school system is quite good, uh, but but certainly there was no sense of um, expectation, and you know it's. Um, you know, people, people. You know where I come from. The jobs were beginning to dry up, but traditionally it was dockers and went away to sea. And you know, it's a, the sugar factory Tate and Lars, which is by us. So, so there was no sense of you know, oh, you know, I'm going to grow up to be a writer. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I went to to college and got kicked out, um, and spent me uh, me twenties going to match and playing in bands, and it was like. Um, then Hillsborough happens, you know, so and Hillsborough was a shock. I mean, I was working in a in an estate agency at the time and Hillsborough happens and it was a, a, a real shock. I kind of ran away from my life and I went to California 
I was working on a building site and I thought, you know what, this is all right now. I'm 29, but what am I going to do when I'm 50? And I thought, you know what, I'll be a writer. On the basis that if you can talk and communicate, you can write. Mm-hmm. It's easy, isn't it? And <laughs> you know what? In a sense, I was right that it, it, it you know, I mean, obviously it's much more difficult, but anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. Uh, especially the writing part of it. Uh, the, the, the more difficult part is making contacts and, you know, sort of, um, and certainly in the United Kingdom, trying to uh, work your way up the ladder in a place where, you know, even in, in the 90s, it was, it's got less and less, but certainly, and, and I'm sure Daz had, had told you, you know, for a long time in the, particularly in the 70s and 80s, a mere accent was criminalised. You know, it's like uh, you know, I, I went for a, a job in the in the the, the late nineties, and um, he mustn't have read the CV properly. He was all like, "Please, when I walk in, walked in, he said, oh, you know, nice to meet you." I said, "Nice to meet," you. and as I got that far into it, and saw his face change, and I thought, "I'm not getting this job." You know, it's like, uh, I, I, you know, so so that so I, I basically I applied for jobs in um, in the United States in California. Um, and go, go, go interview for a, 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 a string and position or writing little bits for the, the, the San Gabriel Valley Tribune. And I was interviewed by a, a very nice woman who liked my accents and overlooked the fact that I had no experience, no ability, no sense, and give me a tryout and trial and error. But then I, I, I got a job on the staff of another paper, the Inland Valley Daily Bulletin in Ontario, California. And it all started from there, you know, and um, I, don't, I wasn't very good at it, but I, I think you try and learn quickly. And if you learn quickly, the one thing about the United States is that you will get opportunity if you, it, it, you know, sort of if, if you show willingness and work hard and all that. And and then when I kind of, when, when, when I decided to come back, I sort of, when my nervous breakdown after Hillsborough had run its course, I sort of I come back and I at least then had some experience, which I could, um, you know, which was used to get a job. And I'd written, um, I'd written uh, high school American football match reports for the uh, for the, the uh, Los Angeles Times in Orange County, and so with that I got the job as a the editor of First Down, the British American football paper at the time, weekly paper. And from that, I, the, the company produced Football Monthly as well, which was, you know, the oldest football magazine in the world, and um, which is, it's, it's gone on to now. I, I managed to take that down. Um, and, um, and from that, I started uh, freelancing around um, subbing, casual subbing uh, as a sub-editor for national newspapers. And that got me a job as a sub-editor of the Times. And again, uh, by that time you're in, I showed a little bit of, um, I think, initiative and knowledge and contacts and got promoted to deputy football editor at the Times and and got promoted to that on um, on the 4th of January, 2005, which was a hell of a time to get into a position like that. And so I went to Istanbul, they sent me on the train to Istanbul and afterwards uh, quite a few people talked to me about writing a book but I didn't really want to do it um they all wanted to you know yeah we won the won the Champions League rah, rah, rah. so I, I agreed to do it with a, a, a an independent publisher who, who was a one-off sort of thing um I don't think they published anything it's another business I've taken down um I, I so I I well, once a far foreign land, that was my story about my sense of what it meant to be a football fan, what it meant to be a Liverpool fan, what it meant to be Scouse. Mm-hmm. And it's the journey to Istanbul it wasn't just a train journey. It was across my life. Um, and obviously, and you know, it says on the back, it's a journey that stopped off in some very, very dark places. And but I went into it. I mean, m- most people who offered me, uh, asked me to write about that, 
didn't want to hear about Heisel. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to hear about Hillsborough. To me, unless you understand what happens at those places, you don't understand what Istanbul meant. Mm-hmm. So, so it was written in. It was written over the summer of two thousand and five, um, and published published then once, and then uh, there was a reprint in two thousand and seven. And it's I look back on it now, and it's it's it seems like a journal of another age. And well, it is, it is. But uh, it, it's I try to be as honest as possible about the the culture and and you know the I mean the the, the woman who was who was publishing it she was very very, very upper class and she she phoned me well she actually we had a meeting one day and she said, she said I don't know whether you understand this but you seem to be you seem to be implying that stealing isn't a bad thing <laughs> and I'm like uh, yeah. <laughs> she's gone, but, but it's a very bad thing and I'm like <sighs> you've got to see it in its context yeah. what, if you call, what if you say nicking is that does that make it better <laughs> uh, you know it's like you know it's a, I would say liberating <laughs> but it, it's, it's you know you know I mean I'll be honest oh boys and I didn't do it myself because I wasn't brave enough fancy I didn't, frankly I didn't fancy going to jail but our boys finance the trips abroad generally by by stealing stuff, mm-hmm. and I'm like, well, I'm you know, I'm not, I'm not going to slag that off, and you know, it's like you know, it's a, it's a, you know, they, they didn't rob from anyone who couldn't afford it, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, and, and there is an element in the scouse personality that, that that you know, it's a, I know we get stereotyped as thieves and all that, but there there is certainly anti-authoritarian and let's just say the Robin Hood mentality. I, I was about to say that as well but also um, I think it's a, a fans fans book um, to be honest um, but I love the part where you, you basically you know you, you, you're going with your mate and he's the one with the ticket and you're just eyeing him just going because you didn't have a ticket right and you decide yeah. that that's what you that's what you did. You, you'd be like, "I'm dead jealous," and I'm starting to think I'm going to take that ticket from you, and you're going to be the one standing outside the stadium. Oh, he was absolutely paranoid. <laughs> and, like, the, the, the paper, the, the like, they, they thought it would be a fun game, like you know, sort of send me there and see if I got in. You know, because what they really wanted is for me to go all the way to Istanbul and not get in and break the peace on that. I was like. <laughs> don't, don't do this because I'm getting in one way or another. And uh, again, they, they, they thought it was real fun until Athens come around and then the carnage outside over tickets. Mm-hmm. And then, like, let's never speak of this again. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, but I mean, as it happens, you know, one of my mates, the, the, the great thing about Istanbul it was probably the last of the. the you look at European finals now and you look at the allocation of tickets and you see, you know, and obviously it's the pandemic and, and all that. So you can't really count the City um, Chelsea game. But, you know, even if you go back pre pandemic, you're looking at uh, for Madrid, um, you know, Liverpool and Tottenham got 16,000 tickets each, you know, and like I, more people. In Madrid, more Liverpool and Tottenham fans watched on telly in Spanish bars than did inside the game, mm-hmm. and you know, that that's distressing. I mean, Istanbul. Everyone who went there got in. Mm-hmm. You know, so said, there were enough tickets floating around, so everyone who went there got in. You know, Dortmund's in in um, in two thousand one. You know, got there on the day of the game, and queued. You know, at, at the stadium at their box ticket office. And got two two brilliant tickets right on the halfway line. Mm-hmm. You know, people generally go in. When United went to Barcelona in um, 1999, they got like thirty thousand tickets, and the um, and and the the, the 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 majority of them were sixteen quid. You know, it, it's changed completely. And Istanbul was the last final. Remember, like that, everything got a bit darker after Istanbul. Um, going to finals, and you know, you, you you found that people who have been for decades and have been to all the big games and had season tickets weren't getting in. And I, I found that like I found that distressing. Even in Kiev, 
you know, I, I met lads there, fellas had known for a long time, and they're like, you know, we're back on the grounds. I am not watching in a bar. And and Madrid was was really bad for that. Madrid, I, it, in some ways, I didn't enjoy the experience of Madrid, you know, winning and that, and, and, and it's all great. But it, it did just stress me a little bit to see, well, quite a lot, to see so many people, so many people who'd paid the dues, who'd been, you know, who'd been, supporters for so long um or or you know even not so long you know younger lads who, who've been everywhere you know who, who who should have been if the world was just in that stadium and and they went and you know the corporate tickets everywhere and you come out and there's people speaking uh a multitude of languages you know and i'm, I'm very welcoming to fans from wherever they come but like again in um Going back to Athens, Athens was, you know, I, Athens was ugly, but I was in a, a, a bar and sitting talking to some lads. And there's two lads from Ireland. And one of them said, I'm really looking forward to the match. And I'm like, brilliant. Yeah, you know, I didn't have a ticket for that either at the time. At, um, I didn't have a ticket at full stop. But uh, uh, I said, oh, you know, I, and he said, yeah, you know, and, and for, it's my first Liverpool game. And I'm, it's like, you know, the, you know, the Champions League final. And I was a bit like, it just, it can't be right. It can't be right. But this is where we are with the modern game. And, you know, you see all the, all the you know, the, the corporate clients who don't give a flying fuck about either team, some mm-hmm. of them, you know, and, and you know, they're going in. And, I, I, you know, I, I think that, 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 that saddens me. And, uh, you know, w- w- hopefully with the virus, Hopefully the virus will be past its worst next year, and it'll, you know, go back to the, you know, the way it should be. But even so, the, the, you know, the allocations of tickets for proper fans is, it's just, it's terrible, and it affects the atmosphere. You know, the, the, the atmosphere in Madrid was really, really flat. I mean, part of it they brought on the bands just when it was warming up and killed the whole vibe. But like, but. The, even so, it was really flat. There wasn't the fanaticism, you know. That there was so many, there was so many, you know, the, the people who, who regularly fill Anfield or fill White Hart Lane. There were so many of them who were outside, mm-hmm. and I, I, I just, you know, I, I, that that just, it, it, it's, 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 it's not a great development. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looked like there was more fun in the fan park than there was in the stadium. And, and yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's and and, and that's what we've we've come to. Uh, the people are traveling at great expense, huge expense, to go and enjoy the atmosphere in the fan park. And I'm like, yeah, I, and it's, it's going back on myself because earlier on I just said if going the match was about going the match, <laughs> I would have stopped going, and that's true. But there were some occasions where. As great as it is in the fan park, that there are certainly a section of people who have who go every weekend, you know, and do that, who, who should have the right to actually see the game as well, and you know, to, to, for the culmination of the day. And um, and I say that that more than anything, just it saddened me, you know. And, and I'm all right, you know, on my press ticket, you know, I was sitting in the front row, way up high, and great view you know it's like they put food on for you you know and all that sort of stuff you know but I, I, after the game we, we went out we went back into town and, and we, we met our mates and like and I said you know and like what was it like and they were oh yeah we found a nice bar you know it was great there was good atmosphere and then you think you know these are these are fellas who'd seen every European Cup final up until then and they're watching in a bar, and mm-hmm. they've got no divine right to get in the match. But season ticket holders travel away, all that sort of stuff, and uh, yeah. Well, Remember I think that, I think that's why it was actually uh, pretty nice um, this last match of the season because all it was ten thousand locals, and and you really did see and hear the passion from the fans, you know. Um, so that really took me aback to just to see locals just in there. 
Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't mind so much about locals because, I mean, you know, they're, they're always that debate we get into, that tiresome debate, you know, the people who are like, oh, you know, it should only be scouts. Oh, stop it. The club's never been just about scouts. Right from the beginning, you know, it's like, uh, you know, the team of Max and bought it down from Scotland. So that that's just, you know, it, it, those who argue that, uh, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, and I think what what's important is it's regulars, People who make that commitment to go to the ground, that make the you know, that make the journey. It doesn't matter where they're from, but it's it's when you see when 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 you see people who have really had no interest in doing anything other than consuming the football, as the, the football authorities would say, through television, through the small screen, and then getting to the big games. And, and there's no answer to it. There's no way of getting around it. But it's just, as I say, slightly dispiriting. Yeah, the atten- attendance, is, you know, for for finals is just going way, way down. Um, you know, and the corporate uh, allocation seems to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, ruining football for me. Um, that, that's why, you know, quite quite a few of my mates would, would rather just go, uh, you know, watch Tranmere, watch Southport, you know, rather than go to Anfield because they can't, they can't get in anyway. Um, yeah. yeah, and same with the finals. They're just like, why am I going to spend this amount of money, you know, just to travel and just to go to a fan park mm, yeah. and, not, and not the actual match, you know, where, while there's people in there that don't give a damn really about the match. And they're in there, you know, drinking the champagne and the cat and eating caviar and not even watching it. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. But, but, you know, football's got to change for the better. And I think um, we've all seen, you know, football without fans is shite. Mm. Uh, you know, watching it on the telly. I used to watch all football games uh, just because I love football. And then the, this season... All I did was watch the Liverpool matches. That's it. No, I, I, I gotta say, I mean, I don't want to be a contrarian about that, but it's like I, I think football's all better without fans, without a doubt. But, but it's like most of the football, probably, certainly until I was um, into my early teens, I watched, you know, was without fans, without many fans, reserve games, you know, we used to go to the reserves all the time, you know. Um, you know, so you go and watch Sunday football, you know, and all that sort of thing. You know, we, we, we it, it's so. I mean, I think, I mean, I've been lucky enough to go into the stadiums during the lockdown, and the, the, the football is by and large as compelling as ever. Um, you know, the, 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 I think we've there's, there's a generation that's that's grown up and. and and there were some people in my generation as well who have only ever seen the stadiums when the the, the, the packed and all that. But you know, even in um, even even in Liverpool's you know sort of peak glory days, you know the the, the treble year of, of, of eighty four, I can remember when there was, you know, we, we played we played um, Birmingham City on the Friday night just before Christmas, and they shook the Camelon Road. There were so few people there. You know, it's um, and and you know, so to, I remember the, the stadiums being half empty and all that. So it didn't bother me so much, you know, because you know it's, you're still there, you're still watching the game and all that. But without a doubt, the sooner everyone gets back in, the better, you know, as long as it's safe. Um, but I, but I, I, I I've I've enjoyed the football in, in in some ways. I've enjoyed it more because you can hear the players and coaches talk, mm-hmm. and from that perspective, um, you know. It, 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 it's been absolutely fa- fantastic, but yeah, it'll be better when you can't hear any of them and you know, the, the, the atmosphere. Hey, Tony, I had a question for you. I, you know, um, one of the, the uh, time periods that I enjoy uh, learning more about is that you know, that 80s time period because. Um, as an American, you know, we always had this perspective of Margaret Thatcher, right? And so as a Liverpool fan, you really can't be a Liverpool fan without changing your your viewpoint about her and just the way she she managed during that time. But to be fair, you know my my perspective on Ronald Reagan during that area has, has definitely changed too for the worse. But yeah. um, 
you know, you, you're in Heisel and you've mentioned that, you know, there, it wasn't just that game. It was part of the atmosphere around the whole city at the time that kind of has brought the, you guys kind of carried anger with you around, you know, now do you, as you know, 35 years, 31 years later, you know, you look at that, that time period and go, how did I get through that <laughs> time where we were just being, you know, had this so antagonistic, you know, to a lot of things going on? Well, it's, you know, people look at the time and you you look at the, the, the unemployment, you look at the poverty mm-hmm. and you look at like, um, you know, there, there was a concern as, 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 so politically, socially and economically on the city of Liverpool mm-hmm. by, you know, the, by, by, by the government. And you look at that and you go, and it, it looks terrible. Actually, it was a brilliant time. It was, um, you know, the, the, the city was buzzing. It was buzzing with a sense of resistance. I mean, Derek Hatton, who was deputy leader of the city council, said there was a pre-revolutionary feel about the place. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't disagree. There was a real excitement. You know, it's like, right, we, we, we are fighting for the right thing. You know, mm-hmm. we, we, we are, we, you know, so that their politics are wrong. And I think everything we've seen unfold since has proved that and um and so you know we, we we were fighting for the right thing but also it was a really creative time people were young young men who um you know again you look back at the 80s and there's a sense that football fans were nihilistic and we went there was a great creative time you know um peter Hooten and, and and the boys created the ends you know the crossover music and football fanzine which has you know set the template for a, a, a lot of things to come you know mm-hmm. everyone was in bands it seemed you know everyone was joining the bands everyone was doing something creative and there was a a great feeling of positivity you know we 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 obviously we were demonized we were um you know demeaned but like we had a great sense of bizarrely of power you know we had a we had a feeling that we were doing the right thing we had a feeling that there was we were doing something special you know whether it be you know, music and when when liverpool were winning you know they, they say everything they liked about the city and, and they said some terrible things i mean you know the uh i i always remember the daily mirror which supposedly a left-wing paper said they should build a berlin wall around liverpool you know, to, to keep the people inside, turn us into a theme park for everything that's wrong with um, with, with with urban, you know, sorts of conurbations. Um, the, the, remember the Sunday Times started a big, long piece on Newcastle. I mean, you know, sort of two pages of broadsheets read. And the intro was, the way the Liverpool accent is associated with violence, the new, it wasn't even a piece of photos for God's sake, and the same with, uh, associated with violence. And it was one of these violent places we've been. I go across the country, I remember coming back from, I forget, where would we have been coming back from one of the away games? We um, we jumped off the train in Wigan, thought we'll have a pint in Wigan. Wigan was like a war zone. All the wolves were beating the crud out of each other. We go back to Liverpool, a supposedly violent city, and you, you, you know, it was, you, you wouldn't see trouble in town. And like, it's, where are they getting this from? Where And and, and Tatcha gave it all away the day after Heisel. She said, you know, these are violent people. Look at their records in industrial action. She equated striking for, um, for, for, for your rights, for more pay, for better conditions with sort of, with violence, mm-hmm. when in fact it was, and you know, and and this is, uh, you know, so the, uh, two, two tribes, which is one of the later books, which is the third book I wrote, um, deals with all that, and it deals particularly with that terrible year of nineteen eighty-five to eighty-six. Mm-hmm. Terrible for eighty-five for, for what happened, but eighty-six was a a turning point for the game and the game started changing its direction. In fact, the, the road to the the Premier, the Premier League and probably the Super League started as Heisel. But like, but it, it, I, I try again to be honest about it, all the negatives um, and let's, you know, be clear eyed about it, you know, and the behaviour of Liverpool fans, including myself as Heisel. Uh, you know, I always say, I, I, well, I think I, I, I did an interview with someone once where I said, and they said, you know, so you, you know, you, you were, you were dangerously violent, and I said, 
no, no. I was a dickhead. Mm -hmm. I was a drunken dickhead. And that's, but that my bell endsrian played a small part in the causal chain that led mm -hmm. to the deaths of 39 people. And, you know, yeah, and that's, that's never good. That's, that's, that's a terrible thing. But, you know, most of what went on at Heisel was just stupidity. And, and the, the saddest thing is that I'd seen worse violence at scores of games. In mm -hmm. particular, there was one a month before Heisel against Manchester United at Goodison, mm -hmm. which was the worst violence I've ever seen. There was fighting in every section of the grounds. People were firing magnesium flares at each other. There was nails hammered through golf balls being thrown. Seriously, the, the veneer of civilization come off that day. Uh, I remember being in town that night. I met me mate and there was just, there, there was murder everywhere. You know, even all the Manx had all gone back to, you know, gone back to Manchester. There was still that, this really horrible violent atmosphere and mates were fighting with mates it was it was just like one of the worst days i've ever experienced and you know and like and i remember my mate saying to me we've all lost perspective we've all lost perspective and i was like yeah you know and and but that wasn't just in football britain had lost perspective you know we were seeing on our television screens we'd spent a year with the miners strike which was a which, which, which was a, 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 an act of political vindictiveness. There was no economic grounds and behind it. It was done deliberately to smash unions. And it was just brutal. It was, you know, you talk about terrorism. It was an act of terror and, and, and you know, by the government. And then and every night from Northern Ireland, you know, you're seeing on your screens in your living room, scenes of rioting and petrol bombs, soldiers on the street shooting at people. It, it was it, 1984 to 85 was the most violence, most violent year I've experienced the mood of violence there. So on, on one side you had this creative sort of thing, this this belief that we were doing the right thing politically and we needed to make a stand against that year. And on the other hand, you've got this and say that the, the government legitimized violence you saw them at all grieve you know the the the, the 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 forces of the state attacked you know striking miners it, it, it's just um, and you know you, you become familiar with scenes where just people were fighting on the television all the time and mm -hmm. it, it it's one of one of the one of the best things that's happened over the course of my life is is britain has become a less violent place where people have become less confrontational and you know there's there's always the scare stories the right wing scare stories um that you know you see and like oh you know it's it's far worse it isn't you know you used to uh, you know someone would knock someone's pints over in a pub and all hell would break loose you know it's like um and it was liverpool wasn't the was wasn't so bad by far the 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 the, the sane city center I, I saw at the time you go to some places and you know it was like you know go, go back to the, the mid seventies Elton John you know Saturday nights are right for fighting that 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 was the mood in in the, you know in this country and it all kind of reached an ugly climax in eighty four and eighty five and you know the, the the football obviously is the biggest expression of working class culture in this country and so football reflected what was going on in a wider society and you know it's and, and, and the other sad thing is our records in Europe was pretty good compared to other English clubs or England teams you know we we weren't particularly violent our boys went abroad and robbed you know they robbed and drank and you know they didn't want they didn't want trouble because that attracted more police and they didn't want more police because you know what that makes it harder to steal and you know, we'll be frank about it. You know, it's like, um, and then what happened to us in Rome when we were really brutalised in '84? Which and it's the other Bucharest. Um, uh, I don't know where it is, but I love it about the '84 team, which is more football book, less about fan culture. Um, the the uh, you know, we, we, what happened to us was basically swept under the carpet and largely ignored by the British media who were who called hooliganism the British disease when in fact it wasn't you know I mean and then in Rome it continues to be 
to, to this day where they've, they've elevated stabbing rival fans into a, into a cultural symbol, which is insane. It's um, um, Punchicati, you know, if you look it up online, the, um, the New York Times of all people um, uh, uh, quoted me about it. So it's, you know, but th- th- this was a, it was a really confrontational time in Britain when a confrontational government um, took an, the ideological fight um, and 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 fought those battles to the detriment of the people of this country. And you, what happens in football reflected all that? Well, I mean, I I I, lo- I love your quote um, from two tribes when you said uh, Liverpool fans uh, are held to a higher standard. Um, and quite rightly, given our history as well, uh, but the coming together of of Liverpool and Everton, you know, for the for that final, really showed, kind of gave the big, you know, two fingers to the government and said, we we can go to a final, we can just watch a football match together. So I mean, it was like the city came together. Yeah, and you know, so I said, I, the the worst thing is what the relationship between the two sets of fans has soured. And since and there were really ugly elements on both sides, but you know Heisel, and it was the anniversary of Heisel the day before we recorded this. So yesterday, from uh, you know, you still get the same thing thrown up. You know, it's um, and most people have, have know nothing about it, know nothing about the circumstances, the backgrounds, and the consequences, you know, and the number of times I get people saying, you know, why do we, in fact, coming out to the quarter final against City in uh, the Champions League uh, at the Etihad a couple of years ago, three years ago now, wouldn't it? It's, um, anyway, I, I was walking behind these two fellas and City fans and they were angry, they just got beat, they just been knocked out and they were going, Hillsborough, 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 all we hear about is Hillsborough. You know, why do we never hear about Heisel? And I was like, Boys, if you if you won't get the big issue, I said in town tomorrow. I said you'll open it up and you'll, there's five pieces of five pages on it. I said I know because I wrote the fucking thing. I said why, why you don't hear about Heisel? I said because there was a full public inquiry. People lost the jobs. People went to jail. Mm-hmm. I said things got better. I said that's why you don't hear about it. And it happened in another country as well. And they were like, oh, 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 you know, one of them. And but you still get it, you still get it, like you no know, justice for the 39. Now, th- there's never any justice for the dead, no matter what happens, never any justice. So, so it's bollocks anyway, you know. It's, it's a bit like justice from I feel that for justice from 96 as well, but it's um, it's it, you know, it's not good. But the thing is, the judicial system worked its way through over Heisel, and you know, you can't say that. There was a cover-up. <clears throat> you can't say that you know those who should have taken responsibility didn't take a modicum, at least, of responsibility. And and there were there, there were people, there were some people scapegoated and ended up in jail, and you know for periods of time. But the the justice system ran its course, which it, which it's never done over Hillsborough. And you know and and again. You know what, what? What aggravates me so much is that people don't realise that Hillsborough is not about Liverpool and it's not about football. What it is is a complete failure of the authorities, the people who are paid to to protect you, a complete failure by them, and then they covered up their own mistakes mm-hmm. and blamed other people. And you know, I keep saying to people, I watch the inquest into the the Manchester bomber. And one of one of the kids who died there died in an ambulance because the communications didn't work properly. The you know um, the systemic problems in the ambulance service, which were the same back in Hillsborough, were not addressed because the blame was thrown at us. What Hillsborough is about is anytime you or your loved one go out to a public event, you need to be sure that those church who are protecting you will do that. And if they fail, they will find out why. You know, it's um, and make sure, try and make sure it never happens again. 
instead, after Hillsborough, they threw the blame, and it's not a Liverpool thing. It's for every citizen in the United Kingdom, and only the dumbasses think it's about football. Mm -hmm. Well, I've also, you know, I, I'll bring that up as well, um, because you, you, Tony, have gotten so much crap on Twitter, um, you know, at, what, like a month ago? Uh, I've never understood it. Um, when you wrote about Hillsborough, you, you wrote because you were there, you knew it, and it, it needed to be, you know, told. And, you know, you've got people, uh, the keyboard warriors of this world, you know, uh, social media has just gone absolutely mental. Um, people think they can say whatever they want. Uh, you know, you've got racism on, on Twitter, uh, abuse on Twitter, and you were getting a lot of abuse, um, you know, for for writing what needed to be written. I, you know, it's like, what the, I don't know what goes on in some people's minds, but it's, uh, it was start, start, started off by an actor who accused me of lying over that day. And then I actually got his phone number within about five minutes. Phones him, didn't pick it up that night. When I phoned him up the next day, it was completely unrepentant. He said, "Oh, you know," he said, "You know, we're, we're both we're, we're all scouts." I said, "Oh, I don't want to hear that shit." And he said, "You know, we all have a relationship with Hillsborough. I've got a relationship with Hillsborough. Are you?" And I'm like, "I stepped over fucking dead bodies yet." And, you know, it's like you know. It, I, and and he was completely unrepentant. He said, like, uh, he said, he said, you know, I think what you said was trite. And well, I better explain what I said. What happened is the day after after I realised what was going on, I ran around the back, and I was come back on the back of the Leppin Lane. There was like sort of a line of police, and and there was people milling around, and some people lying on the floor, and it's a the back of the Leppin Lane, and he wouldn't know because he never went then. i had been there. How many times? Quite a few times. But it was like a little sun trap. And at half time, people come out and take the shirts off. And you know what the British are like whenever the sun comes out? I come around the back and there's people lying there. And I thought, now there's no time to be sunbathing. And then I realised, so just a split second thought, oh, fuck the dead. Or the ranges, you know, one of them. And it's like, and I mean, you know, this is something that, you know, and, and, and someone, and I don't know who was on Twitter, tweeted up and said like, he, he told me the same thing within, I, I say, and you probably need to find out, within days of, you know, it's happening. He told, you know, he told his family the same thing. He's, he's always said this, all, you know, but he, he put up a, 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 the Anchorman meme with, I don't believe you. Know, my face, like, he had the gall to say to me, you know, we all have our relationship with Hillsborough. I, 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 and then the abuse started and like, um, apparently I profiteered from it because I've done the occasional phone call on TalkSport, which... 35. That's spot on, yeah. You know what? It's made it all worth it. I go through it all again. Yeah. And what these people don't realise is, and I'm fairly robust, you know, it's like, um, I've, you know, you, you want, you know, you want an argument, I'll give you one, you know. <laughs> you know I've, I've, I, but I've come to see in probably the past 10 or 15 years, I've come to accept that we all thought it didn't happen to us. You know, we weren't dead. We weren't injured. Even my mate who was in the Leppens Lane had a near-death experience, the one I went through the gates with. Um, you know, he was a bit like, you know, it didn't happen to me. And it did. And it's had a negative effect on our lives in so many ways, but in particular, your mental health. Mm -hmm. And at times like this, at times like last month, it, 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 you know, you, you find it very dis distressing. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying... I mean, the, my overwhelming reaction is I wish there was a cyber punch and I could go through the, the, the internet and, and, you know... But people don't know what they do. And I've, I've come to see, you know, sort of be in contact with a lot of survivors since uh, then, you know, and I never thought of myself as a survivor until I was speaking to Anne Williams, um, God, it would be 12, 13 years ago now, you know, it's, um, and she said to me, you know, and I, she said, you know, it's you I feel sorry for. Are you survivor? I said, I'm not a survivor. She says, oh, you are. 
she says, you know, she said, I lost my son. She said, but I didn't see it. I didn't see it all happen. I didn't see people die. And she said, you did. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm, you know, that's what you say. I mean, and, but that changed me a few on it and I realised that, yeah, we, we witnessed one of the, the ugliest things in modern British history. And then not only that, we were accused of being the cause for it. And you know what? 32 years on, it's a wonder so many of us have survived it. It's a wonder. Yeah, because, uh, you know, you hear of the survivor's guilt, you know, and a couple of people have taken taken their own lives over it. Um, you know, we, we've, we've had a guest on who uh, was also a survivor as well, and you could just tell, you could just see that the pain, you know, that, that um, we, I just saw it then in, in, in your eyes, you know. Um, it's, it's a very tough thing, and, and it must have been tough to actually write about it as well, because then you, you're bringing up your, your own memories of it as well. Yeah, you, you, you know, you, it's, 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 it's not easy. I mean, you know, he's rather not do it. But, mm-hmm. but there are things that are bigger than us. And, and in many ways, it goes back to the, the feeling in 84 and 85, the sense of you're fighting the right battle. You might never going to win. You might never be going to win. And we knew back in 85, we probably, 84, 85, we probably weren't going to win. You know, we, we knew we were heaven for a defeat because the entire forces of the establishment was raised, raised raised against us. And then, you know, with Hillsborough, you know you're not going to win. You, you, you know that things are going to happen like they, they did this week where, you know, the, you know, the only conviction for Hillsborough was the Sheffield Wednesday secretary who was um, convicted of make, not, uh, not ensuring there are enough turnstiles. He was fined 6,500, the only conviction. And yet we know, we know, Duckenfield admitted it. He admitted it at the inquest. We know everyone who's responsible. We know who's responsible for the cover up. The evidence is there. And yet, we, we, you know, we're going to lose. But what? resistance is an end in itself and the one thing now that the trials are over we can we've been gagged for the best part of a decade we can say exactly what we know and over the next few months um once the civil cases are settled which i don't think will be too very long um you know once once that that happens i think we'll see We'll see the full extent of the venality and stupidity of the cover-up, and you know, people probably, probably people are bored with, with Ellsbury. They don't want to talk about it, and so, you know, why, why do you carry on? And it's not for us; it's for the next generations. Because if the police can be allowed to lie, tamper with evidence, mm-hmm. and you know, not only did the did the did the rewrite. Policemen's statements, they rewrote fans' statements. And it's, it's, if police can be, you know, it's, it's, you haven't tried, it's 1984. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, it's, uh, I, the, the authorities can just change anything. You know, we were in a post truth world and we can't allow that to happen. And that's the reason we fight on. Well, that's, that's my next question as well is uh, what, what do you think defines Liverpool and the people? Um, I think, bizarrely, I think it's, it comes down to one simple word, which most people don't realise, Irishness. And the, the, the nature of the city was changed by the, the Great Famine and the influx of people coming into it. And it's only then you start to see the Liverpool being portrayed as a rogue city, as a city of outsiders, as a city that's more violent than anywhere else, when in fact, it, it, you know, it wasn't. Um, a, a city that's drunker than anywhere else. There is an argument for that. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, and, and, you know, 
that, that that's when it changed. And the the I mean, Scouse is a relatively new word. It didn't appear in the uh, in the dictionaries until 1947, um, and it really it started to take hold about 100 years ago in the um, sort of in in the area around Scotland Road, where um, where which is sort of in a city, Liverpool to the north, you know, sort of the, the area of the docks, and it started to take hold there. And it was initially an insult. It was for people who had stew from um, you know, sort of you know street traders who had carts, and that was the poor or went to um, soup kitchens. So it was for people who the scousers were the poorest of the poor, the vermin, and it, it, it was taken as a point of pride. And people until about 1921, people who lived around Scotland Road, which um, the Scotland Exchange electoral area, it, it had um, an Irish nationalist MP until 1929, but they, they thought of themselves as Irish. After about 1921, 100 years ago, obviously the, the Free State was up, up and running, and uh, you know Ireland was given, um, you sort of broke away from the empire. Um, after that. The Scouse identity started to form, and the being an outsider was was, was crucial to it. And and the, again, you know, even across the religious divide, I mean, you know, you're you're, you're just you're ten years younger than me, but you know, so you'll probably remember the, um, the, the sectarianism was much stronger in 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 the that's virtually non-existent now. But it was wasn't too far from Glasgow until the 80s and then it, it died off really quickly but certainly in the in the 60s and 70s it was it was massive but again it's something you don't see in any other english cities so it, it's you know it's part of the celtic influence on the city that made it an outsider you know and um so i i, I think one of the things that you know has, has been great the revival of the uh, you know the when our English were scouts you know um, mm. attitude which I think is is fantastic because the key to being scouts is not English you can't be English in scouts it's a contradiction <laughs> there's a great book by um, uh, it's actually a scholarly book and it's difficult by a fellow called John Belcham from the university called Irish Catholic and Scouts which talks about this identity you know what so if you're supporting England you're not scouts you can be you know, you know Liverpoolians are bad way because Evertonians don't want to call it. You know, mm. you can be from Liverpool and you can be English. That's fine. Just can't be Scouse. Sorry, mate. No, no. Turn your Scouse card in if you're an Englishman. If you're not <laughs> Scouse. <laughs> be a, a Liverpoolian. Be a Liverpoolian. Come on. <laughs> Just don't call Scouse. you're not like me. <laughs> Uh, I'm brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, any 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 parting words for Tony? Yeah, Tony, you know, we appreciate your time and, and we love the passion and learning more about the history of Liverpool and, and conveying that to all our listeners from around the world. So as we we uh start to wind down, what first of all, do you have any books that are upcoming? And secondly, if you were to write a book about this season, what would the the theme be about it? Oh, um, I think if we write a book about this season, I'd call it Michael Edwards' Statue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, um, and what would be? It would be about. <laughs> and I'm not blaming. I'm not blaming Michael Edwards for mm -hmm. this. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a much wider thing, but would be about the failure to reinforce. From positions of strength, winning the Champions League, winning the um, w w winning the, um, the the title, mm -hmm. and the, the the failure to just to give Jurgen the tools he needed, and and he he's got to take a little bit of blame for this as well because mm -hmm. he's bought into the whole Fenway way, and mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm not a Fenway critic. I mean I um you know I, I, I've I've helped. Mm -hmm. The, the Fenway and John mm -hmm. Henry in particular. Over the years, we mm -hmm. our relationship has uh, has changed now. So I no longer I no longer write his statements. Um, right, right. Um, but they've been they've been good owners. You know, they're, they're mm -hmm. not bad owners. It's just that 
sometimes they get a bit too clever for their own good. Sure. And um, and they they were too clever for their own good. Um, we had we were in a position uh, coming into this season where we should have we should have been able to put down a mark at a city mm-hmm. and halt their relentless progress mm-hmm. because make no mistake about it they're going to dominate the next ten years whether we like mm-hmm. it or not mm-hmm. and there's there's not much now we can do about it but perhaps we could have done last summer and we didn't they were they were overly cautious in the pandemic and now we're playing catch up praise the lord they got into the champions league because if we hadn't then it would have been a real ugly situation but uh, well, so th- i'd write about that and and I'd, I'd, I'd write about this season i'd write about how it was a massive mistake not to not to just go with untried centre backs and mm-hmm. say, you know what, we've got a Champions League and title winning front three. We've got a Champions League and title winning midfields. We've got a Champions League and title winning goalkeeper and full backs. Mm-hmm. So, you know what? Mm-hmm. If we can't do it that way, I think in retrospect, moving Fabinho back mm-hmm. was just a huge mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, having said that, I, I'm, I'm a firm, I, I, I said at the time that it would be better to play with centre halves. Positions evolved for a reason, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 um, I mean, and then the business he did in January the, mm-hmm. to uh, to to buy the two centre halves, you know, that, that's where everyone was like, build a statue to Michael Edwards because he's got Ben Davis from Preston. I got a phone call from someone from Preston, and they were just aghast, and they said there, there was no, you know, he's he's he's, he's a good fella. And he's he's at the right level. There's mm-hmm. no way he can play for Liverpool, mm-hmm. and he won't play a game. And so it was window dressing yeah. to to appease the fans. And so I think that 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 that's what I was right about. But then I I think it'd be the book I'd least like to write because let's face it, after the two previous years, you'd have to be pretty damn stupid or pretty damn cheerless to complain too much about this year. Mm-hmm. Yes, strategically. We've lost ground. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I think everyone concerned has so much goodwill then to be screaming hysterical, hysterically mad about it, mm-hmm. especially when they qualify for the Champions League, it'd be daft. So yeah. it's, um, I, I think it's got some work to do. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I think City have stolen a march on us and... Mm-hmm. Uh, and they'll respond to losing the Champions League by spending big. Chelsea will spend again, mm-hmm. so it's going to be an, an, an uphill struggle. You know, it's. Um, I, I think we we've got the best manager we could have, and uh, I think we've got the core of good players. Hopefully, Van Dijk will come back as good as he was. Joe Gomez will come back as he uh, as good as he was. Canate uh, is coming in. Um, and we, you know, we'll, you know, hopefully he'll hit the ground running. Often players from Germany take a time to a transition time. They, they, and we, we, everyone's worked us out. Everyone knows to squeeze the full backs. You mm-hmm. know, it's like all, all this arguments about Trent in England. I hope he doesn't play. I hope he doesn't get picked. But there's no other full back in the world that the other team actually plans for as a game plan to stop him which everyone else forgets in this, but everyone knows how to do it. So we need to change the point of the attack. And, you know, we've seen Thiago come in and it, for me, he's still doing things too slowly. He's not moving the ball quickly enough. He takes that little, sort of like little hitch move before he gives his pass. And, you know, I think next year he'll realise he needs to get quicker. It, 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 he struggled to get to the pace of the game at first. Mm-hmm. Uh, now he's got to the pace of the game. Now his passing needs to be crisper. Because we need we need to move the ball really fast, mm-hmm. and sometimes he doesn't do it fast enough. But he gives us different options in the midfield, so they can't just double up on the, the fullbacks. Mm-hmm. So, so I think there's there's room to be positive there. Um, Salah's, I think, in many ways, I think the way Fenway operates. If it was a normal year, no no COVID, they might think about selling them, cashing in on them, getting the money in that. I think we've got. <laughs> The only way you can get lucky for COVID, from COVID, which has been terrible, so don't want to trivialise that. But I think that might lead 
because the market's depressed and you won't get the money you want for Salah anyway. And there are very few clubs who can afford him. I think we might be lucky in that sense and that he stays because, you know, he's, he's, he's brilliant. I don't know why some people don't, you know, haven't taken to him. You know, there's, there, there are many theories and we could go for the, 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 the knee-jerk one. Well, there's, there's some of that, I'm sure, but I, I, I still don't understand why he's not um, sort of loved more by the fans. So I, I, I think I think there's a lot to be positive about, but we are we do need to refresh a little bit. We need to make good on the mistakes the last two summers, and we 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 need to you know I, I think. Jürgen needs to refine his tactics and change things around. And uh, there might be a case at some point in the not too distant future for Trent in midfield and, you know, again, changing the points of the attack. I, I, I think there's more questions than answers this summer. And uh, whereas I think we largely had all the answers last summer, mm-hmm. and but we, we didn't, we just didn't refresh enough. So I'm, um, I'm, um, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm optimistic about winning the title because City are just so strong, uh, and Chelsea will, will, will be good. I mean, I saw, I saw quite a bit of City and Chelsea during the lockdown, and more than it did of us, you know, live that is. Uh, so, but their passing was much crisper than ours, and mm-hmm. and ours have been so good for the last two years. You know, especially that diagonal ball, everyone's. Mm-hmm. Everyone's worked out that diagonal ball, and the, you know they, they load up to stop us. So yeah, I mean, I think I think there's there's a lot to look forward to, but I think it's going to be a bumpy ride next season. Uh, well, hopefully not, but uh, you know, with, with the with the injuries we've had this season, you know, third place, we've we've just got to say, hey, you know, we we got in the Champions League. We'll see how the summer goes. Uh, you know, see how we start out next season, and uh, you know, bring you back, and we'll have, we'll have another conversation about how 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 we're doing. Maybe at Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, I, it, it, it's one of those things, isn't it? You know, uh, the the minute that uh, I always remember that the minute the minute the season ends, like you know, you think, oh, you know, I'm glad the season's over, and then you you want it back again. I always remember coming out of the American bar on a. Um, on Lime Street, the Yankee, one one early August night on a Friday night. That was one of those very overcast Friday nights, and we mate just stood there and he looked around. You know, everyone else is going, "Oh God, where's the summer gone?" He just like sniffed the air and he went, "You know, yeah, it's chill in the air. Winter's coming. Football's back." <laughs> That's how you feel about it, isn't it? You know, it doesn't matter what state of the team. You know, yeah, football's back. So yeah. The, Hopefully a chill in the air will come soon and the, the sounds of the boot on the ball, you won't hear because of the crowd, the sounds of the cop, you know, it's a, it'll be back soon enough. And, and you know what? It kind of... It doesn't matter if City win the league, really. What matters is the sense of your identity, what the club means. And, you know, we've got a manager that you can look up to admire. The players are mostly, in fact, I can't think of, I can't think of a wrong one in there. But, you know, players, mm-hmm. you, you say, yeah, you know, they're good fellas. Mm-hmm. And wherever happens, there is a, <laughs> there's a sense of drama around Liverpool Football Club and the city of Liverpool that makes us all an adventure. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm 60 years old and the adventures still keep coming. That's what football's about. Adventures. Totally agree. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that as well. Uh I just I just don't nick any any sportswear <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, I was always too scared of ending up in jail. <laughs> I, d- I did take a, a pair of trim chabs one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then then I got it from my mum because my mum was like, Where'd you get those trainers from? <laughs> yeah. Bring out the belt. Yeah. <laughs> she she taught me well after that though. Um, but uh, absolute pleasure, Tony, to uh, to to listen to you. And uh, you're welcome anytime to come back on. Uh, you know where I am. 
Yeah, I do. <laughs> I don't know where you live, but I do know your email address. <laughs> I'm not going to be one of those people <laughs> knocking at your door at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, you know what? The, the, right, the, those people, they all like say, oh, yeah, you know, the, the, you know, you, you better watch yourself, you're in trouble. It's, um, but those when who've come face to face with, who've insulted me or threatened me, they generally... The first thing, well, one of them, like oh, the things he wasn't going to do to me, and the first thing I walked into the bar, and you know, so so saw so this fellow, you know, come over to me, and the first thing he said to me was, "Oh, can you sign a book for me, son? He's a huge fan." I said, "You've been threatened to kill me." Another one, and, and, and the bar said, "Can you unblock me on Twitter?" And don't block many people. So he said, um, "So why did I block you? What did you do?" He said, uh, "He said I called your mother a whore." I said, "Have you been to Liverpool?" <laughs> no, like, no, and he was like, "No, no, I was just drunk. I'm a bit." And then you know, and that people give you the excuse, oh, "I was just drunk. I got, ca got carried away." You know, uh, it's a uh, mo most people in person agree. You know, and it's, they, they they seem to get this persona online. Well, you know, it's a uh, generally if I have a drink with people, they they're they're okay. They're mm -hmm. okay. Well, that's so, the. Th well, that's the thing, you know, if some, somebody shouted something across the street, you know, you go have a word with them, you know, and you can sort it out like men. But, you know, again, I go back to the Twitter thing. There's just too many arseholes on there that just think they can say something, you know, w without any backlash. Uh, and like you said, you saw, saw them in a pub. They'd want your autograph or they'd want to talk football with you. So they're just, you know, they're just morons. I will say, you know, like, you know, you know, you know, Bill Gates invent a cy cyber punch. That's all we need, a cyber punch. <laughs> it can't be that hard to do it, right? No. Ah, well. Well, cheers, Tony. Really do appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, well, Defo, keep in touch. Brilliant. Cheers, Tony. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Japs. <laughs>